In this video, we're going to show how collision theory really forms the basis for what the rate law equation looks like. And so as a review, I'd like to show this image again, where we have Renato trying to kick the soccer ball into the net to score a goal. And this was an analogy for collision theory, where the two reactants are Renato's foot and the soccer ball. And when impact happens, the energy of that collision must be greater or equal to the activation energy of the reaction, which is represented by this goalie here. So a successful reaction or scoring a goal is when the ball kicks and turns into product. But let's say the kick has too low energy and the goalie is able to defend it, or the orientation is bad and the ball goes wide and misses the goal. So orientation of the collision is also as important as the actual energy of the collision. So just a few facts to remind you about collision theory. First, the rate of the reaction is related or proportional to collision frequency. And this is why concentration is important because when you have a higher concentration of reactants, your collision frequency increases and therefore the rate of the reaction increases. Now, not all collisions lead to reaction. To be successful, a collision has to have the right energy to be greater than the intrinsic energy barrier of the reaction called the activation energy, and it has to have the proper orientation. Another important part of collision theory is to explain the effect of temperature on reaction rates. And temperature has two effects. When temperatures increase, molecules move faster. And so the collision frequency increases, which benefits rate. But if you also increase temperature, the collision energy also increases, and that's also directly beneficial to rate. So how does the concentration part show up in the rate law? Well, we know for this general chemical reaction where A and B are my reactants and C and D are my products, we can write this general rate law where the concentration of A raised to the power n is B multiplied to the concentration of B raised to the power n. And so this multiplication factor is showing really how the collision frequency between A and B work. To illustrate that, I show three simple scenarios below where we just have a few molecules of A and B in each case, and the lines that connect them are potential collisions that can result in a successful reaction. So this is a reaction where A must directly collide with a molecule of B to form products. And so the number of nines represent how many collisions there are possible. So in this first scenario where there are two molecules of A and two molecules of B, the number of total collisions would be four. And if we go through these other scenarios, what you'll find is that the number of collisions is just the product, the multiplication of the number of molecules of A and the number of molecules of B. And in other words, it's also then related to the product of their concentration. And so one important facet of the rate law is that the concentrations of the reactants are being multiplied because that's a direct relationship for describing collision frequency. The next part of showing where collision theory forms the basis of the rate law equation is more complex to explain, but let's understand what's still missing. We have an energy requirement for a successful collision. And so far, that's not really shown in the rate law. Also, how is proper orientation of reactants accounted for 
Both of these facets are actually contained in the seemingly simple rate constant. When we first introduced rate law, I had mentioned that the only parameter in this equation that actually varies with temperature is also the rate constant. So again, temperature also has to be factored and that is also contained within this rate constant K. So understanding all of this, this is actually the expression of the rate constant K. And there's lots of variables here. Um, number one, there's a frequency factor A that has both the orientation of the reactants and the collision frequency factored in. And it's being multiplied by this exponential function where it's raised to the minus Ea, or activation energy, divided by R, the ideal gas constant, and T, temperature. This equation for the rate constant is called the Arrhenius equation. And so I provide it here in the exponential form and also in the linear form where the exponential function was removed simply by taking the natural log of both sides of that equation. So K again is the rate constant. A is the frequency factor that will explain both orientation and collision frequency. E is the exponential function. And in this top part here, we have activation energy, which generally the units are given in kilojoules per mole divided by the ideal gas constant times temperature. Temperature is usually given in absolute Kelvin, and the ideal gas constant is joules per mole Kelvin. And so you can see that the joules and kilojoules here don't exactly match. And oftentimes you have to write, rewrite activation energy in terms of joules for this equation to work properly. Now in this linear form, it's a bit easier to see how activation energy and temperature can influence the rate constant K. If you raise the activation energy because of this negative sign in front of this last term, you will lower the rate constant. If you raise temperature on the other hand, because it's in the denominator of this last term with a negative sign, you will actually increase the rate constant. In the next part, we're going to dissect the Arrhenius equation into the frequency factor and this exponential function. So the frequency factor A is basically the probability for successful collision. And A itself is a product of P and Z, where P is the probability of a correct orientation. And this value is usually less than or equal to one. So you can think of 100% being the maximum probability of a correct orientation. Z, on the other hand, is the collision frequency. So here's an example where in this reaction, nitric oxide and nitrate have to directly collide to form two molecules of nitrogen dioxide. And so here you have pictures where NO is on the left, nitrate is on the right, and they have to collide. But in each of these orientations, it's misaligned and it cannot proceed to a successful reaction. So these are all ineffective collisions. An effective collision, on the other hand, has the correct orientation where here the nitrogen in NO is pointing directly at an oxygen atom of nitrate such that on collision, this oxygen atom can transfer to NO. So this is an effective collision. And just an idea of how important this probability factor is 
only six out of 1,000 collisions for this reaction will have the proper orientation. So this p-value is actually very, very little, much, much less than one. The second part of the Arrhenius equation is the exponential term. And this exponential will describe the fraction of collisions where the energy requirement is matched meaning where the collision energy is greater or equal than the activation energy. This plot below illustrates this concept, where in the y-axis, we have the fraction of collisions. And in the x-axis down here, we have the collision energy. So let's basically focus first on this blue curve. This blue curve describes all the collision energies that happens for the system. There's a distribution of collision energies um, where most of them have an average collision energy right in the middle of this peak. Now activation energy is a specific value and let's say the activation energy for this reaction occurs here. So that most of the collisions are actually not energetic enough. And then there's only a small fraction of collisions shaded here in purple that do have sufficient energy for a successful reaction because they're greater than Ea. What happens when you raise the temperature? So T2 here, represented by this red curve, is a higher temperature than T1. And when you raise temperature, basically all the molecules move faster. So even though you have a distribution of collision energies, in general, the average collision energy is going to be greater at the higher temperature than at the lower temperature. And you can see we're getting closer to Ea. So here, the fraction of collisions in the system is represented by this area under the red curve. And there's a larger proportion of collisions at this higher temperature that now meet this energy requirement for a successful collision. Up until now, we thought about the activation energy as the minimum energy needed for a successful collision. Another way to think about the activation energy is that it's the energy of the activated state or transition state. So what do I mean by an activated state or transition state? When you have a chemical reaction from reactants to products, in the last semester of general chemistry, we might have talked about the difference in energy between reactants and products. And so if this is an energy scale going up, then the energy of the reactants would be compared to the energy of the products. And here the products are lower in energy so that the delta H of this reaction is negative or exothermic. But chemical reactions don't just happen downhill like this, where reactants fall into products. And that's because for this reaction to occur, bonds in the reactants must be broken to form the new bonds in the product. So instead, what reactants have to do is actually pay an energetic cost to reach this activated state or transition state that's much higher in energy. And in this state, the bonds are partially broken as the new bonds are partially formed. And this energy cost would be the activation energy. And so for a reaction to proceed, the reactants must first go up in energy to this activated state before they can fall down in energy to the products. Chemical reactions can proceed in the forward direction as described, but they can also proceed in the reverse direction represented by this dashed arrow. And there's an interesting equality between the delta H of the reaction 
and the activation energies in the forward and reverse direction. This is best illustrated again using this energy diagram. So let's say I want to start with products and end with reactants. Then the delta H of the reaction is actually from product to reactant. And so it would have the same magnitude as delta H in the forward direction, but it would be opposite. And so this would be an endothermic reaction. Now the activation energy is still required because we still have to reach the same activated state to move between products to reactant. And this activation energy barrier in the reverse direction is represented by this dash arrow in peach going upwards. So you can see that the relationship between the red, the peach arrow, and the blue arrow is actually shown by this equation here where delta H is simply the difference between the red arrow and the peach arrow. Another way to think about this is that delta H is the sum of the red arrow and minus the peach arrow. So that would be shown as this black arrow, which is equal magnitude to EA, but it's being multiplied by minus one. So the direction is in reverse. So if you sum the red and the black arrow, the net result is this blue arrow going down. Now, if a reaction has to overcome this activation energy to proceed, then it becomes very important then to know what that energy of the activated state is. You can actually calculate the activation energy, again, using experimental methods where you basically vary the temperature to find the rate constant. And both of these methods uses the Arrhenius equation shown here in the linear form. So in the first experimental method, we collect data for various measurements of K at different temperatures, and you plot natural log of rate constant over one over temperature. So in this linear form, L and K is Y and X is one over temperature. That means your slope is minus the activation energy divided by the ideal gas constant. So if you can read out the slope from such a plot, you can solve for the activation energy. And the intercept would be the natural log of the frequency factor A. And so if you also wanted to compute A, you could get that from the intercept. The second method is to measure the rate constant just at two different temperatures. And you can use this equation where the natural log of the two rate constants is equal to activation energy divided by the ideal gas constant times one over the first temperature minus one over the second temperature. Now this equation is actually derived from this linear form simply by writing it twice, one for one temperature and again for a second temperature. And because these are the same chemical reactions, A is the same and activation energy is the same. The only thing that varies is the temperature and the rate constant. And so you can subtract and rearrange to obtain this equation here shown in yellow. The activation energy is the energy cost it takes to reach the transition state. So the transition state is also known as the activated complex. And it's generally a very unstable species, one that you cannot isolate. And part of the reason is because it doesn't have fully formed chemical bonds, but basically partially broken or partially formed chemical bonds. It represents the highest energy state during a chemical reaction from reactants to products. This is an example reaction where methylene bromide is reacted with 
hydroxide anion. And the product here is the formation of methanol, where the hydroxide forms a bond to the carbon and the bromide is released. So in this snapshot of reactants colliding and then these products um, leaving, you can imagine that the transition state might look something like this. Since the hydroxide replaces the bromide, maybe there's a partial bond between carbon and bromide where that reactant bond is being broken and a partial bond between the carbon and the hydroxide where that bond is being formed. And so we can call this structure with the partial bonds the transition state. And this is kind of exciting because it's kind of guessing what the black box is that happens in a chemical reaction when reactants turn into products. Now, transition states are almost a figment of our imagination. We can measure the activation energy, but we can't really see the transition state. Um, we can't truly observe them, and they're very difficult to observe because they're so unstable that their lifetime is on the order of femtoseconds or 10 to the minus 15 second. Chemists like to use a reaction energy diagram to describe what happens during a chemical reaction. This diagram is a plot where the y-axis is the potential energy and the x-axis is the reaction progress as we move from reactant to product. It's sometimes referred to also as the reaction coordinate. So here at initial time, we have reactants and they have this energy level. And then we go through a high barrier to the transition state or the activated complex before then falling downhill to the products, which have a lower energy than the reactants, so that the delta H of the reaction is exothermic. Like that prior example we talked about where the carbon bromide bond is broken for a carbon hydroxide bond, this is a cartoon illustration of that reaction where we have these reactants and the blue sphere and the green sphere exchange in the products. And in the transition state, we have this partial bonded species where both the green and the blue sphere are partially bonded to the carbon, but one bond is being broken while the other bond is being formed. A reaction energy diagram can also be useful to illustrate this energy quality that we introduced earlier in this video, where we have the activation energy in the forward direction, the activation energy in the reverse direction, and their difference is equal to the delta H of the reaction overall. In the last couple of slides, I'd like to share an exciting discovery that was awarded the 1999 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. This essay can be found at the link below, and it was written to describe what the discovery was. What would a football match on TV be without slow motion, revealing afterwards the movements of the players and the ball when a goal is scored? Chemical reactions are a similar case. The chemist's eagerness to be able to follow chemical reactions in the greatest detail has prompted increasingly advanced technology. This year's laureate in chemistry, Ahmed Zawail, has studied atoms and molecules in slow motion during a reaction and seen what actually happens when chemical bonds break and new ones are created. So Whale's technique can be described as the world's fastest camera. This camera uses laser flashes of such short duration 
that we are down to the time scale on which the reactions actually happen, femtoseconds. Now, one femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. That is lots of zeros. And one femtosecond to a second is like a second to 32 million years. And remember when we talked about the transition state, I had said that it can be very short-lived on the order of femtoseconds. So only by using femtosecond spectroscopy can chemists actually see what a transition state looks like. All right. With femtosecond spectroscopy, we can, for the first time, observe in slow motion what happens as the reaction barrier is crossed. That's referring to the activation energy barrier and hence also understand the mechanistic background to Arrhenius formula, which we talked about in today's lecture for temperature dependence. And the Arrhenius was also awarded a Nobel Prize in 1903.